Zimmerman. It's right. to commemorate the yard site of Ruth's parents, Sarah Miriam Bat Yamina Cohen and Yosef and Abram Abba. So, okay. so may the Neshama have an aliyah from the Deber Torah that we speak today. And we do thank you for the sponsorship. We're going to be doing today Parshas Mikes. This is a great Parsha for a Broadway show. It is a great Parsha for uh, children to be uh, amazed at the story. I remember as a, at a young age, loving this Parsha, the excitement. Couldn't wait for the next week when finally Yosef really shares with his brothers his true identity, page 222. Uh, as we grow older, we develop difficulties with this portion. It seems to be like a game. And, you know, the questions we have of, of, of Yosef knowing very well that his father is worried, and worried would be a light word, uh, about his welfare. And not one message, not a letter. Uh, here's the man that's the second in command in Egypt, and he ignores the welfare. And as Nachmanidi points out, it only takes six days to get from Egypt to Hebron. Six days. Couldn't he send someone? It, it, he's quite disturbed. And obviously there's a plan. Yosef is planning something. There is something that's driving him. And that's why the dreams have to be understood, and then perhaps we can develop an appreciation for what he is doing and why he is doing it. When we start off this week's portion with dreams, we immediately go back to the dreams of last week. Yosef having dreams, the 17-year-old having dreams, and sharing them with his brothers. And if you look at the dreams, number one, you sense uh, the difference of what is considered a Jewish mission, vis-a-vis -vis the mission of humanity, what God wants from the Jewish people, and comparing it to what the Almighty wants from the nations of the world. Yosef has two dreams. Dream number one relates to wheat. Stocks in the field, sheaves of wheat, they bow to him. That's dream number one. Uh, dream number two, he has this vision of celestial <coughs> bodies bowing to him. So first is a very physical dream. We, food, that's how we survive in this world. And the second dream is on a realm that obviously symbolizes something spiritual. Now that is very much the Jewish journey. Jewish survival is number one, take care of the most basic needs of others. And that's the greatest kindness, by the way. Right? They say in the name of Rabbi Israel Salant that for a person to be concerned about the physical welfare of another person is a spiritual obligation. In other words, the physical of the other becomes my spirituality. Yosef, obviously in those dreams, is having a vision of a leader. He is taking charge of the family. So dream number one is, if you are indeed a leader, take care of others and their physical needs, right? They, of course, turn to you. You're going to guide them. You're going to organize their, from country uh, to tribal location. You will take charge of it. It starts off with the physical. It, it is upgraded, meaning in Judaism, the survival, physical survival is not just for existence, but rather for something much greater. To be a spiritual being to utilize the physical and bring the spiritual into it. And the two dreams are basically giving us this message. Yosef sees himself. Now we have to address why there are those dreams. But the reality is dream number one is the physical. Dream number two, the celestial bodies, the stars, the sun, the moon bowing to him. It indicates that he takes charge of their spiritual welfare as well. That's Yosef. Then we start this week's Parsha, and this week's Parsha starts off with the cows. We have the seven cows of the beautiful appearance, robust cows, being swallowed up by the ugly appearance and gone flesh cows. And then dream number two relates to sheets of wheat. That, that appears as the second dream. And it works as follows. Commentators point out 
that if you want to uh, understand a message of a word, look around Tanakh where those same words appear. There is in the book of Amos, the book of Amos complains about the corruption that existed among the northern tribes of Israel. That the leaders were fat leaders, taking care of themselves, ignored the welfare of society, and that's what corruption is. Corruption, and uh, you know, you visit countries, I'm not in, in insult anywhere in South America right now because we have some of my good friends who just returned from there, but the reality is you look at Mexico, right, Mexico? So we knew very well as kids that a policeman is a person who pays to become a policeman because the income from bribes is so great that it's a worthwhile position to have. Okay, that's the beginning of the end of a society, when there's corruption. And when leaders fatten themselves, right? You know, you read about the Iraqi nuclear reactor. 1981, Saddam Hussein had a very clear agenda uh, to build a nuclear reactor and to wipe out Israel. No question about it. And thank God we had a leader like Menachem Begin who doesn't care about what the world has to say and takes care of it. Where does he get the material for it? Who supplies the Iraqi for the peaceful energy that they seek? Of course, the French. The French. And it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Chirac. I think it was Jacques Chirac. Not Mitterrand, I think it was Chirac. And it, it, afterwards, as you know, people were reading into it, why did the French supply a nation that obviously is a rogue nation, you're de dealing with a brutal dictator that would cut tongues out of mouths of people to scare the wits out of them, wipe out families. H how do you explain it? The answer is money. There was a lot of corruption. Fat leadership. That is the reality. And that's what Ramon Shalom is critical of the northern tribes. The northern tribes, we talk about their exile. So as little kids, you are taught that that's because they bow to small idols. In other words, that's how we were taught, Avodah Zarah. But it was far more complex. They made gods, gods that fit in their pockets, meaning that they could go ahead and dictate wrong from right. When I have a, when I have a creator of the world that gives me Torah, so this God will establish for me wrong from right. And I will improve. God understands that I'm going to stumble because he made me into a human being. But that will never corrupt the wrong from right. And if there's a feeling of guilt that I made a mistake yesterday, I'm going to go ahead and deal with it. That's the God of Israel, and that's the God of righteousness, and God of Israel wants me to be concerned for the welfare of the poor and act in a kind way and smile to society. These are basics of Judaism. If, on the other hand, my God is a God that I determine wrong from right because I, he fits in my pocket, he fits into my pocket, and I don't mean, you know, the phone, I mean the Navodah Zara was a little image. Archaeologists have found little small images. They were on their keychains, probably, and in their pockets, and they would take them out. And that was a symbol that represented their God. But there was a great amount of flexibility. And they could decide that to satisfy that God, I could get rid of my neighbors who was agitating me because my God wants me to do it. It's a very flexible God, a very destructive one, obviously. And the leadership was corrupt. So the book of Amos tells us that you should know, Hear all you parot habashan. Parot habashan. You are fat cows. Cal suddenly becomes a key word for corruption. And therefore, when you start off this week's portion and you talk about the two dreams, you know what the two dreams are? The Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh has an issue in his society that has to be fixed. Number one, deal with corruption. That's why the dream starts off with fat cows. After you deal with corruption, you know what the Almighty wants? The Almighty wants the world to function. He wants people to settle. He wants people to live. It's interesting that the people are always taught about religion. <clears throat> you know, that religion means uh, you do a mitzvah, you put up a mezuzah, you keep Shabbos, you light Hanukkah candles, which is all true. But sometimes you forget about the foundation. The foundation for all religion is the fact that God values life. God values people values humanity. And the greatest mitzvah that exists is called for humanity. Yishuv ha'olam. The world should be settled. God wants that. 
when people go to work, when you see traffic in Toronto, right, when you're not, you're not budging in traffic, and you look around and people, and the majority of people are going down to do productive jobs. The majority, not all. In other words, in Jewish tradition, if you are going to work to uh, run a casino, it's questionable if that is really necessary for Yeshuv HaOlam. I don't know if it's necessary for the world. You know, it's nice to relax, but to believe that that's really necessary for the welfare of uh, humanity, questionable, quite questionable. I play it safe, because you never know. You know, right? you know how it is. Right? You know, someone raises their hand and like, they say, my name is Trump, you know, and I have a, a casino or win or what other big names are there that I have to... Edelson. Edelson. Oh, is that? Is that really good for the world? But if you are in any an industry, right? Lawyers, doctors, educators, uh, provide. You know, you know, you're making plastics for containers. You know, you're using paper for a computer. Anything you do, I'll, I'm, I'm, I can't cover everything. <laughs> dentist, of course. The dentist, right? If you assist people that they have straight teeth and get rid of their cavity, cavities and get rid of gum disease, and how can I forget accountants, right? So, and, and furniture, and orthodontists, and all these people that are Osteen. Investment bankers. I have that here too. Huh? So, Osteen be Yeshuvo Shel Olam. They are doing a mitzvah of settling the world. That is the greatest thing. That's what God wants. God wants the world to exist. And for humanity, that is mission accomplished. Be a good person, right? Have sensitivity, right? Don't be cruel. Have justice, and when there's justice, people can function. That's what God wants from the world. And suddenly we approach the dreams that appear in the beginning of this week's portion, and we have an understanding that here God wants something else. When Yosef is dreaming about this unique role of taking care of the physical and then the spiritual, that's a Jewish dream. The Goyesha dream, what God wants from humanity, you know what he wants from them? Get rid of those fat cows. And number two, take care of the basic needs. People should have what to eat. That is considered a mitzvah. Have the world function. Things will not function when there is corruption. They talk about Africa, right? And there are fam the famines, that, you know, the, the, the lack of water that exists in some countries. And it is as if because of the fact that there's not enough of a rainfall, therefore there's starvation there. That's not true. Because in California, there's also a drought, and everyone is doing very well there. What's the difference? The United States of America, or North America, Canada as well, if there's, a just, if there's a society of justice, you could work things out when the leaders are actually concerned for the welfare of a society. If it's in Africa, where the leadership are poros haboshon, right, they act like animals, unfortunately, and there's corruption there, people are going to starve. That's what this dream, and this is what Pharaoh is having a dream, and who plays the role, who's going to play the role of fixing that society, Obviously, Yosef. That's what we have. That's piece of information number one. Now, the story itself we know. We've read it. We've heard it. We've seen. We've read. We've seen lots of literature about Yosef being the the, the whiz kid coming out of jail. He's 30, he's 30 years old. So when you're talking to teenagers, you say he's an adult. When I talk to people that are a bit older, you'll still view a 30 year old as a kid, right? It's all relative. I'm not saying. I'm just. I'm just saying. <laughs> the, Yosef is a young man, and I think even today in politics, right, when you talk about a role of leadership, a 30-year-old is obviously a, a young man, our prime minister. He ain't no Yosef, but he is young as well, and he's, I think, in his uh, early 40s. How old is he? 43. I'm Shaqin. Nobody's talking. So, I'm older than that. You could be prime minister. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, Yosef himself takes over the role and he runs the country in a very efficient way. Right? And he deals with the corruption that exists there. It's regional. Right? In some areas, in some areas, he believes in big government. <coughs> According to rabbinic tradition and the commentators, they note that he controlled weapons and horses in Egypt, meaning he wanted government to control a few things. At the same time, he centralizes the power, getting rid of corrupt regional officials. This is Yosef doing a real tikkun olam, really fixing the world. But at the same time, he has a plan, because then his brothers show up, and what does he do? And what does he remember? So I think we're going to go ahead 
and skip forward and look at the key words, the key words of what happens. Page 234. Now, when he sees his brothers, if this is a person that... 234? He sees his brothers. If, let's say, he sees it as an opportunity to punish them for what they did to him. Right? It's payback time. So obviously, the text would tell us that he remembered the fact that they sold him. He saw his brothers. He remembered what it was to be in a pit. He remembers what it was to be undressed and handed over as a commodity to these Ishmaelim. He remembered it, and he felt that this is the time to go ahead and take revenge. So you would expect, if indeed all he is doing, the Oshirite, is only for that purpose, the text would say, Vaiskor Yosef et Mechirato. That's not what the text tells us. The first verse on page 234, which is chapter 42, verse 9, Vaiskor Yosef et Hachalomot. He remembers his dreams. That he remembered that he dreamt about them. And then he starts acting. Then he rolls up his sleeves, and then the games begin. And boy, were there tough games, right? He sends back money. He scares them. He makes them bring down Binyamin. And then at the end of the portion, his game continues. He terrifies them by believing that they're not going to get their brother back after they promised their father they're going to have him back. Why is he doing this? This is the question that we have to ask. Okay, what is he trying to achieve? So we have to remember is that even though we are talking about uh, a family, and you know, I have the tradition, I grew up, I, I studied in the Tells Yeshiva. The philosophy of Tells was that we understand very well that the matriarchs and the patriarchs and the tribes are great people. They are here to teach us things. They are individuals that indeed have the merit. We mention them in our prayers, and we adorn the Sefer Torah with their names. They were humans. They were humans. And therefore, you could assess, you could use psychology to try to understand them. This was the Tell's philosophy. Not everyone agreed. There were those who believed that it is not an appropriate way of dealing with things. Correct? But it was uh, an approach to a, a psychological approach. There is a joke that in, in Europe, there were different yeshivot that had different philosophies. There was the yeshiva Slabotka, Slabotka yeshiva, which was a suburb of Kovna. And the focus of the teachings of Slabotka were known as the Gadluta Adam, the greatness of the human being. What a human could achieve. And they energized their students to achieve things, to make a difference. And there was the great rabbi, Rabbi, Naf, Naf, uh, rabbi Natan, uh, Rabbi Finkel, Rabbi Finkel was known as the older from Slabotka. And my grandfather had the merit of studying under him, and he actually took care of him the last years. And he told my grandfather, this is the story that my brother came back from Uruguay sharing with us, that he told my grandfather that your potential, your strength, and your contribution could be in the rabbinate, and therefore you should spend 40 years in the rabbinate. And therefore he entered into the rabbinate in uh, 1929, and then in 1969 he said, that's it, mission accomplished, right? My master told me that that's what I should be doing. Mission accomplished, job, you know, complete. That's the Slabotka approach, the greatness of the human being. On the other hand, there was the Navardic approach, which we could expand on this, that focused very much on how human beings need to break themselves, right? Work on, you know, destroy their ego, recognize their flaws. And the Tell's approach was always analysis of the human condition. And the joke was that we talk about Adam and Eve before the sin and after the sin. Before the sin, they were very great beings. After the sin, there was a fall. So in Slabotka, they talked about Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, before the sin, when they were very great, close to God. In Navardak, they talked about Adam and Chava <coughs> after the sin. In Tells, they talked about during the sin, because it was an analysis of the psychology that was going in. This was the joke that occurred. Now... With understanding that they are human beings, we have to remember, we are going to try to understand Yosef, his brothers, his father, and the whole family. 
What was their, we're not going to use the word meshugas, but what was occupying their mind? And once we understand what was occupying their mind, we're going to have a little bit of an understanding of Yosef and his dreams and how he dealt with them and why he felt a drive to deal with them. And it works as follows, and this is very clear. Avram Avinu, right, the great-grandfather of these tribes, is told by God that you should know your destiny is the land of Israel and to have an impact on the world from the land of Israel. That's Jewish destiny. Return to the land of Israel, be a light upon the nations. And again, the contribution Israel makes upon the nations is not technology. It's very nice that we get our intel chips from Israel, right? And we are very, very proud of the fact that so much of the technology in these pieces of equipment that waste hours that they come from Israel, we're very proud of Jewish, no question about it, right? We take pride in our children, we take pride in our family, we take pride in the fact that the Israeli pilot's an incredible pride we could take. But that's not Jewish. The Jewish mission is values, the purpose of life, right? Like Yosef's dream. We want to help people have, if we could go ahead and Israel does, assist countries that when there is a drought, California could turn to Israel for irrigation to figure out how to maximize every drop of water. That is indeed a Jewish mission to help the world to survive. That is dream number one, obviously a Jewish message. But there's one more, the purpose of life, right? Meaning, we know very well, we're not just satisfied with physical comfort, we need more, okay? That is Jewish destiny, in the land of Israel, preaching a Jewish message of values. Beautiful. But to reach that destiny, and here come the problems. Here comes some serious problems. Avram Avinu is told, Yadu'a you should know, that what? that your descendants are not just going to reach this, this, this uh, stage by just walking up a few steps. They're going to go through a difficult period. There's going to be a bitter exile. There's going to be suffering. To reach the light that you will create, the light that will inspire the world, you're going to go through darkness. Okay, God says. Abraham is aware of it. He finishes the dream. Right? And he turns to Sarah and he says, What? I have uh, good news and bad news. Right? The good news is that we're going to be a light upon the nations. The bad news is that we're going to be going through an exile. Us? She wonders. And he says, No, no, no. The children will deal with it. Right? But it's a reality that we have to be mindful of. <coughs> and when Yitzchak reaches a specific age, and Avram knows that it's Yitzchak's descendants that are going to have what is destined for them and their destiny. He shares it with Yitzchak, and Yitzchak struggles with it, but he accepts it. And he shares this with his two children, because Yitzchak knows there, in his mind, both of them will perhaps play a role in this Jewish message, if you remember. He envisioned a partnership. Esav is aware of it. That to reach our destiny, we have to, we're destined to go through darkness. Yaakov is aware with, of it. And each one deals with it. We're going to find that Esau and Yaakov, both of them deal with this understanding that our family is going through some, going to be going through difficulty. How, we don't know. Where, we don't know. How long, they're not sure. Because you know very well, even though they were told 400 years, right? Accountants work things out. 400 turned to 210, correct? And if you think about it, it's very possible. My father notes in one of his notebooks that... He saw that if you, when Yaakov reached a specific point, he did the math of the age of all his children, and he added up all the years, his own years and his children's years, perhaps his wife's uh, ages as well, and it reached 400. And in his mind, maybe we already reached that crucial number, and perhaps now we could settle in the land of Israel and achieve our mission. Meaning they didn't have clarity regarding the exile, but they knew very well that there was an exile waiting. So therefore, Esau, for example, you know what happened to Parshat Vaishlach after he meets Yaakov? Where does Esau go? Seir. He just leaves the land of Israel. Why does he leave the land? You know, he, he, he cried his eyes out when he loses blessings. He valued the relationship he had with his parents. He was there for many decades. What happened? So the rabbis tell us 
that what drove Esav away was the understanding that there is a bitter exile waiting for the chosen one. He had no interest. He couldn't deal. They woke up every day, perhaps, and there was a dark cloud. They were mindful of it. There's difficulty waiting for us. I don't want to be part of it. I'm leaving. That's what happens with Esau. Yaakov, remember the beginning of Parshat Vayeshev, Vayeshev Yaakov, the Eretz Megurei Aviv. Let's analyze those words. Yaakov Yashav, Yashav, settles, the Eretz in the land where his father was, a Ger. Sojourn, in other words, the father didn't have permanence there. Yitzchak did not view his existence in Israel as permanent because he was mindful of the future exile. Yaakov was hoping that all the difficulties he experienced, all the tsaras he had until he made his way back to Hebron, that should count as the exile. He was hoping that it would be over. Bikesh Yaakov, the rabbi tell us, Lishev Bishalva. He had enough meaning. He too, it was on his head, it was on his mind. So these serious concerns, these significant concerns about the exile were occupying their minds. And now, the 17-year-old, charismatic, bright, good-looking young man who views himself because his father has a very close relationship with him. Ben Skunim, you know they said the Ben Skunim? Right? You could ask my kids, right? That they, they, they note a little bit, a bit too often that they see the youngest doing whatever on earth she wants. And they would remember, boy, if we would have done that, <laughs> do you know what would have happened? And it's true, when it comes to a Ben Gunim, right, you're sapped out of energy by that. Right? <laughs> genuk is genuk. And it, it, it's, it's tough to be the oldest, that's why they deserve double, because the oldest trains you, because when you get a call from the school, that uh, your oldest son hacked our computer system, right? You go crazy. My kid would do such a terrible thing. And then when it comes from the fourth son, you get a call that he was uh, disrespectful. He said, okay, well, well, kids are, you know, kids will be kids. Like, I got trained. I went through this already. <laughs> so he's a Ben Skunim. Yosef is a Ben Skunim. But the rabbis add that he was actually, the word Zaken relates to wisdom. He was the son who the father handed over all his wisdom. There was a very, very unique and close relationship. So this is no average Ben Skunim who's a spoiled individual that's only loved, but rather it's one that has wisdom from the father. And he has suddenly, remember, and all this, if they would be sitting there on Freud's couch, there is no question, my brother probably would tell me the exact address in Vienna where it is, but... Uh, <laughs> If they would be sitting there on the couch, their awareness of what, this, what is waiting for this family obviously occupy their conscious and subconscious identity because it was something the family was always aware of. And here, he suddenly has dreams. And for Yosef, these dreams are not the byproduct of him sitting around daydreaming and thus having dreams at night that are impacted by it, for him, this is prophecy. I have a mission. The 17-year-old wakes up the first morning and has a mission. I will take care of the physical welfare of my family. And the second night, he has a dream. I will take care of the spiritual welfare of this family. I am a leader, and leadership in his mind is what's going to save them from the dark years. For Yosef, his dreams are dreams of salvation. Dreams that perhaps somehow we could work around the numbers, we're not going to go through an exile. And therefore, he is driven to share it with the brothers at a young age. Big mistake. How do you think the father reacted? So we are told that when Yaakov hears it, he's first critical of Yosef in front of the brothers, but then the Torah adds these incredible words. Ve'aviv shamar et adavar. He kept it, meaning for the father, this, is, this sounds good, there's something here. He held on to it. The father sensed there's something there. Yosef will play some kind of role, some kind of role that will save this family. They were hoping, Yosef was hoping, Yaakov was hoping, that the role played will put an end to the exile. There won't be, exile will be something of the past. The tsarists of the past are over. They have reached 
their destination, the land of Israel. That's what they were hoping. And Yosef, unfortunately, as he is sold, he still remembers those dreams. And in his mind, suddenly, the dreams of brothers bowing to him, accepting his authority. And the second dream, which included, by the way, the moon, the sun, included his his father, his adopted mother, Bila, in other words, the maidservant that took care of him, they were included as well. So when he sees his brothers, he says, now it's time to go ahead and deal with these dreams. And there was even more than that. When they see him, when they see him, and if you look back on page 232, at the end of verse 6, what happens when they see him? They see the authority the person in charge of their survival during the famine. Vayavoa ha Yosef, this is at the second half of verse 6. Vayishtachabuloa paim arza. They what? They bow to him. Faces to the ground. And in his mind, dream number one, taken care of. And now, this is good. But I think Yosef recognized something. As a 17-year-old with those dreams, he was hoping that those dreams would somehow put an end to exile. At this stage, he sees it very different. At this stage, when he is in Egypt, and he has the power in Egypt, and he's running the country, he sensed the exile that great-grandpa was told is going to occur here. I can't avoid that, but what I could do is I could upgrade it. I could change it, that the exile they're going to go through will not be as bitter. I could create an environment, and that will be achieved. And that was what was the, the, the dream was about. The dream was not, this is Yosef talking to himself, the dream was not the way I envisioned it or understood it or give, gave it an interpretation at age 17 that it is going to be that they will bow to me and thus no exile. The dream means that they will accept me. The exile here will be a very easy one. I could fix things. And indeed, there's a rabbinic statement that you should know. Ra'ui haya Yaakov avinu le'ered le'mitram b'shal shela'ot shel barzel. A rabbinic statement that you should know. Technically speaking, the exile in Egypt was something that the Jews had to go through. And technically speaking, going into exile meant in those days that you are captured by bandits. They chain you just as the Jews were chained when they were taken centuries later by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylonia, that would have been the natural course of things for Yaakov and his children, to be taken into exile in chains. But by accepting Yosef, what Yosef was able to do was that they came down in roy- with royalty. And this is what Yosef is trying to achieve. So as soon as he reaches a position of power in Egypt, He doesn't want to tell because in his mind, he has something far more important than taking care of his dad's worries. He has a dream to take care of, to deal with. This is no dream. For him, this is prophecy. And this explains everything he is trying to do. Now, he has to back things up a little bit. In other words, he knows very well that he has a few years that are missing. Right? In other words, he shows up in Egypt. He was in jail before. I'm sure the official press was not allowed to talk about it, like in many countries. The media is controlled. Things that are not positive regarding their leaders are hushed. But if if you ask the right people, if you ask the right people, you'll find out some interesting things. Yosef is concerned that the brothers are here. He's going to be tough with them, and they're going to start asking questions about, tell me a little bit, this leader, Yosef, where is he from? So the first guy's just going to walk by, and then eventually at a barber shop somewhere, the guy's going to tell him, ha-ha, Yosef, you want to know the real story? Uh, rumors are that uh, he, he was sold. Sold? Where? In, in the land of Canaan. <coughs> he has to be sure they don't ask questions. You know what's the best way of preventing a guest from asking questions? Right? Accusing them of being spies. Right? <laughs> that's, how, that's what you do. And th- this is severe. This is, I mean, again, this would be a very serious crime. It's not like you're supposed to go to Shanghai and go to Beijing or something like that. <laughs> We're talking about a real, real, real crime here. So therefore, Yosef starts off by saying, Meraglimatem. 
it ends all their inquiries. Okay, verse 234. He remembers their dreams. He tells them that you are spies. And then the game begins. But he wants to achieve one more thing. You know, there was tension in that family. And this is something we have difficulty, thank God, understanding. When there are several wives, right? So you were, you know, I always say, you were how did you do the taxes. But there's so many questions I think psychologists could deal with. Like, the structure of a family that is so problematic, right? Even the term in Hebrew for a co-wife is a tsara. <laughs> really, this is in Hebrew, and this is not a coincidence. It's an absurd system. It is absurd. And my father would always point out that if you look at the ideal patriarch, the one that lived a full life to 180, the one that never left the land of Israel, he had one wife, Yitzchak, because the other ones, they did it, this is what society did, don't consider it anything but a problematic existence. And there was a lot of tension in that family between the brothers, because they come from different mothers. And Yosef wanted the brothers as well to have an opportunity to do tshuva. Meaning, the selling of Yosef was because of the dreams. No question about that. Right? In their mind, this is a young boy who throughout the day is dreaming of taking charge of us. So obviously at night he's going to have these ridiculous dreams. And these are dreams in their mind, which would, could cause their father to reject the other ones, just as their uncle and great-uncle were rejected. So they're very concerned. But there's one other aspect. You have to remember that, remember that the tension between Leah and Rachel, the two wives and sisters, carries to the next generation. And Yosef wants to be sure that the sale was not the byproduct of the hatred to a child of Rachel, and therefore, he creates an environment where Binyamin is now on the line. And that's what's happening at the end of this week's portion, at the end of the portion. Yosef says, you can all go home. I, th this goblet of mine, this gavia, which it seems to be that in those cultures, uh, the, the, there were those who believed that you could get information, just as today it's from a cup of coffee and uh, tea leaves or coffee leaves or toffee grinds. You go to these people and uh, they used to have them on Finch, but the, many of them shut down. They didn't see it coming, right? <laughs> <laughs> they had them, they had on Finch, really. You drive on Finch one after the other. They, have, they had it. So in those days, the, the, the wine goblet somehow served that purpose. So Midrashim tell us that the idea that as the brothers with Binyamin are leaving, and he tells his. Uh, Assistant, take the goblet, place it in the sack of the youngest of Binyamin. Right? This is a very significant item because it could be used to clarify, see the unseen, and predict the future. So Binyamin now comes back, and of course they find it there, and he turns to the brothers and says, you, you're all free. You're okay. All I need is this young man. He is a crook. He shall remain my slave with me, and he is giving them an opportunity, an opportunity to do tshuva. You know what tshuva is? Tshuva is that you are in the exact same circumstances that you failed and you are able to overcome. Right? The person <coughs> traveling and he's hungry and he's in a bad mood and he eats something he shouldn't. Complete tshuva is that you are in the exact same environment and you right, make the right decision. He wants to go ahead and create, right, construct an environment where Binyamin is on the line, a child of Rachel, and they stand up, which they did. So this is another achievement there. But his main goal is dealing with the dreams. And indeed, he deals with the dreams, and he wanted to hold on, if you, when we read next week's portion, we'll see that he wanted to hold on to even bring his father down, because he believed that perhaps if he has the complete picture put together, if he has the celestial bodies, his parents, meaning stepmother and father bowing to him, perhaps he can reduce even more what's occurring in Egypt, perhaps even lessen the burden of the exile. But we are told that Yosef could not, lo yechol Yosef, leitapek, he could not hold the emotions. And several times in this week's portion, we're going to see the emotions of the man. Here's his brother, 
right? And he interacts with Bin Yaman after not seeing him. There, it is a very painful experience for him, but he senses, he feels, this is something I have to do. It's a mission, it's a calling. It can only <coughs> be understood with uh, th- th- this introduction, with this idea that this is a family with a mission, a family with something they understand. You can really say, when you look, viewing our future destiny is a little bit dangerous at times. You know, you talk about the state of Israel, and you talk about Messianic Zionism. In other words, we're very supportive of Israel. Many of us believe that this is not random, but rather, you know, Mashiach will come, maybe as a result of the existence of a Jewish state. We don't want, at least I don't want, political leaders that will be religious Messianic Zionists. I don't want a, re- I don't want a prime minister that's going to be wearing a kippah one day and make decisions based on the fact that he learned Midrashim to talk about a big battle that is going to occur. Why do I not want such a prime minister? Because then he perhaps would say, listen, I could go ahead and attack a specific nation. If worse comes to worse, they retaliate. Okay, it's uh, the Messianic era. It's okay. And I remember reading Midrashim as a child that there'll be great destruction. It is very, very dangerous when you walk in, when you make decisions with what you believe to be a vision of the future. It is always important to make decisions that are rational. When we read prophecies and we talk about future times, you have to remember that there's flexibility. In other words, that it is a direction that's given, but nothing is predicted in detail. And, you know, people talk about, it it, it disturbs me when at times kids talk about the Gog Umagog battle. Have you heard of the term? The Gog Umagog battle. And they suddenly are told by educators that there's going to be this tremendous war, as if it is going to occur in the future. And is that helpful to be mindful of it? I personally would tell kids that, you know what? Such a concept exists. Perhaps it's a metaphor, or perhaps... We had those difficulties of the Messianic era. And all those dark predictions of Yemos HaMashiach that you hear did occur already. And now, let's be optimistic for the future. And it seems to be that this issue of their awareness of what is waiting for them created the problem. Meaning this awareness that Yosef wakes up in the morning and he has these dreams and he is aware that there's some problems in dark years waiting for them. And he feels that he has the tools to deal with it, that itself became the vehicle for them entering into exile. Mm -hmm. Right? You say, a mensch, you know, a mensch tracht, people think, but God, you know, the Almighty, he laughs. In other words, we try to go ahead and all these maneuvers made by Yosef, as a 17-year-old we're talking, because he believed that this is going to save the family, welcome to Egypt. That was the byproduct. And it's important to be always, have a rational Judaism. Make decisions based on wrong and right today. And the welfare, the physical welfare of people is fundamental in Judaism. And once there is a physical existence, we could talk about taking care of the spiritual identity of our people. These are the messages we have to take from this week's uh, Parsha and always carry the optimism that the good days are ahead because our destiny is the land of Israel with a wonderful message for ourselves. And always remember, humanity will eventually recognize our role. Humanity will eventually recognize what we are about, and we're getting a little, we're getting sparks of it. In Israel, so many times you meet people that love Jews, love Israel. I lived in the South, right? And how many times in Walmart I'm stopped, and like, I love Israel, I love the Jews. Now, they have their own agenda, right? They're waiting for something a little bit different than what we're waiting for. <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, there's a lot of good happening, and it's the, the good days ahead are supposed to be... Uh, the message of what we are about. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you for coming. No class next week or the week after. It's, we're having our winter break. <laughs> winter real. That's the semester is over. Everyone passes. <laughs> and please come back January for our second semester. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Are you going to skiing? Skiing. Now we're going to the moment. Yeah. Well, as. Uh, <clears throat> my capacity as a half president <laughs> and in concurrence with the other half who's sitting over there. I want to wish everybody a happy and sweet 
Hanukkah. Thank you. And in order to enhance the sweetness of the Molesky family's uh, Hanukkah, we have this, which is the deed to um, uh, chop the moose. <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking. Uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Rabbi Molesky for the wonderful shiurim he's been giving us, including the one today. Thank you. And he may not know that, that one, he's from Pels. You may not know that uh, sometime in the past, Tells was considering opening a branch in Hawaii, and they were going to call it Tells of the South Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. See you all, guys. Wrap that up in January.